Thank you all for coming out today. Thank you, Pete, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, makes me feel like somebody else should have walked up here who's slightly more important than myself. Uh, thank you also, David. Uh, I have, really have to thank the entire staff of SDMA for allowing me to do my show and speak here. They've been uh, absolutely fantastic. And the Feldman, the curator, who's just been uh, uh, great to work with. Um, and Nicole, who's here. Um, and, uh, you know, the entire staff, I can't thank you enough. And I also have to thank Tiffany, who's here as well, because she's really been a great uh, help and support throughout this process. And thank you guys for showing up today and online as well. So uh, hopefully I have uh, an, a worthwhile, interesting presentation for you. So that's me. Um, and uh, uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, so I'm calling this presentation this establishment. I came to embrace the disruption. And, you know, I'm standing up here at the stage. I, you know, I, uh, looking high and mighty and very important, but the process of making art is anything but uh, detached from people and places and stuff. So I'm gonna take you through uh, how I got to the point of doing this show um, from my work early on and then how my work over the years uh, led to doing this work. And hopefully I, you'll, you'll find this interesting and especially if there's any uh, artists out there who are trying to figure out how do I, uh, how do I get my work into museum and gallery show? How do I grow my career? Maybe you'll find some insight through this. That sound good? All right. And if you guys have any burning questions that are really relevant, uh, you can write them down the card. You can also uh, raise your hand. I don't mind. As long as you don't ask me, you know, if I use a tripod or something to keep it relevant. Oh, and I, let's see, I, here was my, uh, you guys want my social media information, Instagram and my website, you can see more of my work. Some of the work that I'll be showing here today is on my website, so you can go back and take a look at it. All right, so uh, for those of you who uh, have been to the show, this is what it looked like up until uh, yesterday. Um, uh, the work is sort of, uh, um, really, uh, gorgeous prints, you know, just really rich, rich flush of prints of uh, Bears Ears and Escalante National Monuments, or areas that have been within those national monuments okay. or excluded from them. Uh, okay, the okay, cool. Um, well, I got the link and uh, I see that and then, uh, it started. So uh, thank you very we're much for your help. The walls. Uh, it's a bit odd to walk right. through the, uh, the museum and to see hanging hardware and uh, wall text. With no art there, uh, something you'll ever uh, usually see. Um, so it's a bit odd. And then yesterday we took the work out and uh, I invited people to, to bash it up, um, to hit it with picks, we marked it up. And so this is the end result of one of the pieces from yesterday. Are we and and uh, the idea behind this work is that uh, the areas that I photographed are areas that could be damaged or destroyed through coal mining, oil drilling, um, and, and uh, commercial exploitation. So the idea is that the damage we're doing to these prints of the area are representative of the potential for damage that could take place to the actual landscape. Um, so, okay. Um, so, the, you know, this is what one of the prints looked like before, and this is after. So this is one I did in the studio. All right. Um, so that's that's what the, the that's what the current show is. Just so we all are on the same page and we know how to, what the endpoint is, where we're going, where I'm going with my talk here. Um, so I'm going to start. Let me take you back. Take you the way back machine. So my background is not as an art photographer. I do not have an MFA. I don't have a BFA, uh, I don't have a you know, master's of fine arts or a bachelor's of fine arts. I come from the background of commercial photography. I made images that are about happy people being happy, right? That's what advertising is. Um, very, uh, uh, you know, photos that, that, that 
There's a narrative contained within the photograph that's very easy to grasp, right? This is actually a magazine cover for um, a magazine local cover. But you know, you, you, there's fashion, and you, you get this story of this woman, you know, riding her, her hair flowing. Everything's perfect about this. And so, what I learned through my photography is to speak the language of commercial photography, which is very accessible, right? You know, the, the colors are, are on point, the fashion's on point, uh, everything's rich in detail. It's the fashion that I shot um, somewhere along the way. Uh, and, and so, you know, and I also photograph weddings. Uh, and again, weddings, you're, you're telling a story, happy people being happy, uh, you know, this idea of uh, making a story that's very easy to understand. In one second, you know what's going on here. You don't need an explanation for it. And, and I want, I'm showing you these images because this is my own personal background, but it's also to, to distinguish what you see in art photography. Art photography tends to be more nuanced, more deadpan. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's when you don't necessarily know what you're looking at or why you're looking at it, right? You have to bring a little more meaning, you have to do a little more work in order to understand or interpret the work. Commercial photography is very easy to get. So that's my point here. So that's where I got uh, my start uh, for many years. And then in 2013, um, I started transitioning, or kind of in a transitionary period. Uh, the work I've been doing was sort of burnt out on it, not really interested in pursuing it, was looking for new challenges. Uh, and I had heard about uh, uh, an oil um, rush that was uh, taking place in North Dakota. And um, uh, in, in this region of Dakota called the Bakken. And so I had in my head, you know what? I'm gonna go drive my exam to North Dakota and I'm gonna photograph it. And I, I really brought, the, the aesthetic I was sort of had in mind was kind of the W.G. Smith, black and white, very, uh, you know, hardcore photojournalistic perspective. And I really wanted to tell a story. Uh, and, you know, for me, this image it has uh, the uh, kind of almost the look of the, the migrant mother, um, Sophia Lang. Um, Sophia Lang? Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, the migrant mother, you know, where she's the concerned mother and the kids are in the background. And here you have, you know, a, a, a migrant, uh, they're migrants from another state coming to North Dakota to make a living there. And they're in this tight little trailer park. So, you know, for me, it was an opportunity to tell a story and use what I had learned from um, photography and, and, and kind of work in the style of my photographic uh, idols. You know, here kind of this, you know, the working man, very graphic, um, sort of Pachinko sort of uh, look here with these iconic men. Let me see if I can move this. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you know, so it's very iconic black and white uh, style of photography and tell the story of these men working hard in the, in the plains. Um, this gentleman had, uh, he rolled, he, he was an electrician, he crashed the car and they just came across uh, the crash room after he, he uh, told his car and help, offered to help him out. And then when he, I saw he was okay, I'm like, well, I'm going to take photos. So um, that's what we do. I had just been kidnapped literally by oil um, executives. So uh, this is quite a day. And that's another story that if you ever have an opportunity to have to tell. But it was an exciting time. And I really dug myself in for several weeks working in, um, in the oil country telling the story. Uh, and I, uh, I, you know, as a commercial photographer, I have technical skills that, that many. Art photographers may not, right? I know how to use lighting. I know how to, to, uh, to work on location with lighting. And so part of what I did was take portraits of these workers. Um, and, and these guys, uh, they, this guy had just finished a 12 hour shift on a work over crew. Um, and so I was able to get them right as they're coming off work and, and then photograph them. And again, working in the style of uh, uh, I admire Richard Avedon, you're probably familiar with his in the American West series, uh, his series of uh, uh, cabinets in, in, in you know, uh, 
this sports cabinet back in the 70s. Just very simple, iconic portraits. And, and so I was seeking to emulate those, but updated it in, in using color. Uh, and uh, this outstanding gentleman here, working, uh, he, he's uh, working on a fracking uh, rig. Okay, so, uh, so that was my first kind of attempt or introduction into working more in the world of art photography than commercial photography. Um, and uh, so about 2015, fast forward a couple of years, I moved into a new place and I was a little bit frustrated because I felt like I was detached from, you know, my peer group uh, and it was a Starbucks on the corner. And I was trying to figure out, I, I moved to Logan Heights, I was trying to figure out, like, you know, what can I do? And uh, I built this fence around my house, a beautiful fence. And, uh, and then I started to photograph the people that lived near me in my neighborhood. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna put portraits of these individuals on my fence. And I decided to call this series Neighbors because they were my neighbors. And, and I remember the, when I, uh, I had done the first two portraits and I was with my assistant, we sat outside the driveway. We just sitting there, it was nighttime. We put the two portraits out there and we're sitting there in the shadows, drinking a beer, wondering what was going to happen. You know, I had no idea. I'd never done anything like this before. And people started walking by and they stopped and they started, you know, talking about the photographs. And right away I could see, okay, well, they're not out just telling me, so that's good. They're not going to destroy the photographs. So I went and put out all the photographs. And I did get a lot of attention. Uh, you know, news media came by, there was articles written. Um, and uh, it, it, it encouraged me, you know, I'd say, wow, okay, I, this part has legs. Uh, but the best part of it was, uh, for example, this gentleman here on the right with the hat, um, he came by and he brought his daughter and his granddaughter. And he, he, uh, he'd been in the military, retired military, as in Navy. And he was almost in tears at seeing his portrait on the fence. Uh, you know, he'd gone his whole life without any recognition. And, and so, you know, for him to see himself kind of, you know, larger than life up on the fence, it meant a lot to him. And, and he had to bring his, his, you know, his, his granddaughter and his daughter to come see the photographs. And he was so thankful. Uh, and, you know, which to me, I was just thankful that he had posed the camera and was okay with me uh, uh, having his, uh, his portrait up on the fence. So it really showed me the power of what I can do. Uh, and, and to a, a, an audience, you know, when, when I'm working with um, a bride and groom, you know, I'm impacting them. But with art, we can really go beyond that um, and impact a much larger group of people. So then what happened is over time, uh, I had these portraits up for about a year. And over time, the, the, uh, the, the prints themselves changed and they became a record of their time in the environment. Just like a record that you play on a record player is you know, the result of a, a needle creating a groove on the, the vinyl. You know, these prints had become a recording of their time in the sun, you know, the sun beating down, changed the colors. Um, people uh, tagged the photos, they scratched them. Um, you know, the dirt took its toll, the atmospheric elements took their toll. So just their time being in the environment changed them. And so I actually did a show at Bread and Salt Gallery here in San Diego called uh, Manifestations of Change. Because now these portraits were no longer just representations of individuals, they were actual manifestations of change, right? They, the change had manifested itself on these prints. And now these prints are unique. And so I'm telling you this because all of this is directly related to what's happening outside. So if you start to make connections between this and what I'm doing out there, you know, that's, that's exactly where I'm going with this. So here's another portrait. And you can see how it's been faded and kind of beat up and tagged and marked. And so that taught me that the, the photographs, the prints themselves, can be unique artworks because typically within photography you have the negative or you have the digital file and you can make you know an unlimited number of prints now the photographer may choose to create an addition 
that's smaller than that, you know, three prints, five prints, 50 prints, 100. But these prints are unique, right? They're one, they're, they're unique art piece. All right, so the next step, what I decided to do with the neighbor's project is I decided, you know what? I'm going to take this to all 50 states. I'm going to photograph Americans in every state in the country. And so I began going all across the country, uh, from Maine to Florida to Texas, you know, you name it, uh, in, in big city, small city, photographing wealthy people, poor people, uh, black people, brown people, Asian people, you know, people of every nationality, and, and just trying to create a uh, uh, sort of a, a cross section uh, or, or document a cross section of America through portraiture. And in the middle of this, uh, I got a call from the Anchorage Museum in Alaska. And they said, hey, would, would you like to uh, do a show here at the Anchorage Museum? And I was thinking, well, I got to get to Alaska and that's going to be expensive. So, you know, yes, of course, I'd love to do this. So uh, I didn't think it was going to happen over months, you know. Uh, we would talk a little bit. And finally, one day they called up and said, okay, well, we're ready to buy your plane ticket. So I guess this is really happening. So I flew up there with my assistant and, uh, and then I showed up uh, on the first day that I was there to have a meeting with the director of the museum. Now, I thought the Anchorage Museum was probably in a strip mall, you know, some little, like, you know, little thing. And I was just like, whatever, you know, I'll float out the museum. And so then I showed up to this and I thought, I'm gonna need a bigger boat. And uh, you know, I had no idea. I didn't even bother to go to their website. It's uh it's gone. Um, so but you know, it was a really fantastic experience, an amazing show. And what it did is it created a template for uh, many of my future projects, where uh, in this case I did my portraits and we displayed them outside the museum, right? We did a beautiful uh, indoor gallery show, and then we also exhibit the photos outside. So now, when I say created a template, because now what I've done and what I'm trying to do more is, yes, we have the work inside the gallery walls, but you know, there's a small subsection of the population of people who actually go to museums. But if we take the work out, outside, and then we tie it in the museum, now we magnify the voice of the museum, right? And we opened up uh, what the museum, uh, yeah, the museum much larger. And, uh, and so my work is by my work. You want to do Also, the museum then has a greater yes, I have, I'm bringing one anyway. I got a lot of interest in the museum. I got a lot of interest in the museum. Let's have to uh, so it's, uh, 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 <clears throat> you know, again, yeah. it's kind of got yeah. thinking yeah. about, okay, well, you know, now we can take out the traditional um, uh, framing and hanging of art, and we can, we can go out, which is what I'd already done, right, with, with my first generation of neighbors. Now I was able to tie it in with uh, larger institutions. Okay, so, uh, so now this happened in 2017. Um, in end of 2016, 2017, I moved to New York. I, I call it a long-term residency because I ended up coming back. Um, and the residency, I, I took a residency in, in New York City. Um, and again, playing with different methods of, uh, of exhibiting work. And this show is actually here in Barrio Logan at the CM Curatorial Gallery. And with this, what I did is I actually repainted all the walls of the gallery to match the backgrounds of my photographs and then printed the photos on vinyl, self acoustic vinyl, really big, so that it kind of created an immersive experience where the, the work is in frame. Now the work is part of the walls and it's kind of one seamless uh, viewing experience. And I even put the work on the walls, on the floor there. You can see I painted the, the, the back wall red and then they had the uh, photo in the back also red. So again, experimenting, trying new ways to uh, to exhibit art, exhibit my photography. Uh, when I, I was in New York City, I also there's a lot of vacant uh, commercial uh, properties, a lot of vacant retail space there. And so again, kind of you know using sort of this idea of commercial photography, but 
we, you know, tweaking it uh, for art, um, you know, there's lots of window displays. I wanted to put my work up also for the commercial window display. So I went around early in the morning and paste these photos on onto the windows of vacant uh, space. So like my own form of tag. Uh, this is a, a installation in Oklahoma City. Uh, they had a, it was Oklahoma uh, Bank building, um, and they commissioned me to install my portraits on the windows there. So again, you know, looking for new ways uh, to exhibit photography. This photo on the left actually, uh, uh, a, uh, the head of the uh, Hispanic Business Association or some Hispanic group uh, protested uh, the gentleman with polo, and they don't, that, that's not representative of how um, Spanish Express in Oklahoma City and it was offended by it. So we ended up having to take the whole installation down. And I'm like, uh, hello, you know, I'm Hispanic, this represents my reality, you know, but you know. Anyhow, so uh, now working, somebody asked, actually asked me yesterday if I have done any installation work. And uh, so this is an installation I did. Uh, it, it's, it's called Buy White Privilege. And we created a white privilege card. I worked with uh, uh, White Expressions, a, a, a local uh, group uh, devoted to, um, they, they do like a spoken word event. You know. Uh, poetry uh, uh, night, and um, so we collaborated to to sell white privilege cards to people of color, and we created a storefront here. And again, using the language of commercial photography uh, in service of art. So you know, you can see here that the happy black couple with you know buying their house, and the idea is that they have this white privilege card, and now they can buy you know a, a nice house in the white neighborhood. And one on the left, uh, there's a police officer uh, with the young black man. Because the, 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 the man has the white privilege card, you know, he's treated with respect or whatever. And um, so we created this whole store. This is the card that we created. We had people come in, I would photograph them, and then we print on the spot uh, a card. And um, I can use this to buy alcohol. I don't know if that's white privilege or not, but uh, it worked for something. Um, and, you know, it was, we created this whole store experience, and it was a very emotional experience. It, it was funny, you know, the idea of buying white privilege, that's ridiculous. But, uh, you know, behind humor, there's a truth, right? And, and the, the truth, and this is before uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, you know, so, uh, I don't know. A lot of, you know, now I think some of the idea of white privilege, everybody knows what it is. But even just a few years ago, it's like, what's that? You know, there's a lot of pushback against it. But for the people who are participating, for the people of color who participated, it was very emotional because I would hand them the card and I'd bow down and hand them the card. And, and you know, uh, some people almost cried, you know, because it was something that they had never, you know, something that they had lived their whole lives without. And so to have this moment was, uh, it was very real, uh, it was very powerful installation. But it, it was also a lot of fun, a lot of people came out. And so again, using photography, but now uh, using it as an interactive, as kind of one part of an interactive art installation. All right, so next up, uh, Neighbors in New York City. So I was in New York City and um, and I, I had my part on the Lower East Side of New York City, uh, right near House Street. And I was walking along one day, and I was walking past this big fence outside the First Street uh, Green Art Park. And I don't know how I got the idea, but I thought, you know what? What if I put my photos on the fence? And I thought almost a quarter mile long. And I thought, wow, you know, it's on House Street, which is one of the busiest streets in New York City, which is, of course, the busiest city in the country. And it took a while, you know, I had to go through, jump through hoops, I had to go through the parks department, et cetera. But I finally got permission and I installed over 80 portraits from my neighbor series. Uh, there was at least one portrait from every state in the country on this, uh, on this fence. You know, so the gentleman on the left here uh, was from Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, the fellow on the right, 
Detroit, how can my memory stay? Washington, D.C., New York City, and so, you know, it was really uh, fantastic because I would sit there and I would see people walk past, and they would just walk past, and then they would look to the left or to the right, and they'd slow down, and then they'd stop, and they'd go from the portrait to portrait, and they'd get to the end, and they would read my, my text, and they'd learn what it was about, and uh, it kind of shows them, like, how people uh, can interact with art. Uh, and uh, so, so this is, you know, it was really, it was really great. And you know, one of the great things about uh, doing a show so public like this is that, you know, there's thousands of artists in New York City, but this was so visible that I, I would show up at a party or some people would ask what I do. And, you know, I'm an artist. Oh, I'm an artist. There is an artist, right? And I go, oh, I did this thing. I'm like, oh, you did that. So uh, to get, you know, to get recognition in New York City isn't easy. And this actually appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, as one of the top uh, public installations in the US uh, in 2018. So it's really, really uh, uh, gratifying, uh, a lot of fun to put up. But got tagged. Now, I knew it was going to get tagged. And in fact, I hoped it would get tagged uh, because that's what I wanted, right? Because I knew that the work could then go from just being a print to a unique work of art that was a record of its time in New York City. So the only problem was they tagged it really heavily and they tagged it sooner than I would have liked. And uh, it, the, the show, I think it was supposed to be up for six weeks or eight to two months or something. And um, I did an interview with a local newspaper and I thought they were gonna talk about the art, but all they were interested in was the tagging. And the whole thing is about tagging. New York Parks Department found out about it and they said, you know what, you have to take it down. Either you clean it or you take it down. So I couldn't clean it. So I had to take it down uh, two weeks early. That was the only sad thing. But, uh, you know, like I said, I, I was uh, planning on it being tagged. I did want that, you know, now instead of the art, what happens when, when, when art is on the wall, uh, there's a dialogue and there's an interaction between the viewer and the subject or the viewer and the art, of course, the artist and the art. But now we have this dialogue of, of, of record. You know, here was somebody actually directly interacting with the art, reading the record. And what exactly it means, I don't know, but that's part of what art is. We need to figure this out. You know, what, what these tags are. Um, some of were more interesting than the others. But so this is what happened to the work. And, uh, but again, you know, even though I was disappointed to take it down, I welcomed it. And um, uh, so uh, I did a show at Studio Channel Islands um, up in uh, Camarillo. And so I had a bunch of portraits uh, printed, all nice and fresh, but then I also had some of the images from uh, New York City. So the work now continues to live on and it lives on as a unique work of art. Okay, so now that brings us to the present. Any questions? Is any of this remotely interesting? Uh, yes, there's a question. And we'll have a full, full QA later, but it doesn't get to the time. Well, I mean, I can't understand what it means either. <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, there's a language being spoken here, and uh, frankly, I don't know what that language means. I'm not a tiger. And I'm, you know, I don't. I don't, you know, it's mostly, um, well, okay, so here it says, maybe demo BB piece, get me off ERG, you know, I mean, who knows? There's one call me Mitch, demo BB. So I guess, it's, you know, there are various taggers and they're leaving their tag on here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, actually here in, in, oh yeah, I'm sorry. The question, uh, well, it was actually a comment about, well, first of all, the question was, what do the tags say? And I was trying to answer that. 
And then there's a comment that police often have sort of catalog uh, taggers and, and whatnot. Uh, and, and that's a possibility I, I haven't explored. Um, you know, in New York City, it, there's just so many, I, I, it might be difficult to follow up. But where I live in Logan Heights, I have had some instances of that on the work. And there it's just a little more obvious that you know who's doing what. Uh, okay. So again, we're here in Camarillo. So now here we are in Southern Utah. And oh, there's one more point that I want to make. You know, talk about the commercial work um, and 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 the work that I'm doing. As as a visual artist, I speak a language. Actually, I speak different languages. Just, you know, just like we have language, verbal language, in in photography and visual art, there are different languages. And so uh, what I wanted to do in creating this, this work, this establishment, is speak the language of commercial photography and then use it in service of art. Um, and I'll talk about that as I look at the work as it looks at the moment. But this is, you know, this is my uh, RV here, uh, out of Bears Ears. Go out there. And again, just like I did with the Bakken, you know, North Dakota back in 2013, I was like, you know what? Here's an issue that's important, important to me. I, I've been a rock climber, I've been a hiker, mountaineer. I love exploring the, the desert and the wild places. I'm very much at home uh, in, in the outdoors. And so the idea that this area that uh, I knew was truly really beautiful could be destroyed and damaged. Uh, you know, I felt like I had to take some action. So uh, I'm an artist, I figured I'd make art. I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do when I got out there. I just knew that I wanted to photograph in the areas that had been removed from federal protection. The, the, the monuments still exist, but they've just been shrunk in size and chopped up. So this is this is out there uh, right at the edge of uh, Escalante Grand Staircase, or just Coming in, rent that car. That car was like three hundred dollars a day for an old beat up one. You know, and sun, once the sun starts setting, and the puts light up, of course, you know, it's not jump around, run around, man, and trying to get as many photos as can. And then, uh, so it's you know, it's kind of an iterative. iterative process where I was like, okay, I want to go photograph in these areas. And then the idea was, well, how can I make this interactive? And then what if I, actually, I think my first idea was I would destroy damaged images to, um, so that, that was represented as a potential damage for damage. And then I thought, well, what if I can invite the public to do that? And then began sort of experimenting with how that could be done. Um, and so, you know, now maybe you can see where, like my past work has really informed how, I, how how this whole project came to be, right? Well, you know, inviting the public in, and and having the work itself be um, uh, a record of its interaction with the public. And so that was yesterday, actually. So yesterday we had the work out on the steps of the museum, and allowed people to hit it with paint pens. Uh, with various implements of destruction and just really go to town and beat it up. And we'll be doing that again today at two o'clock. So come on. Uh, and so here's, you know, I, I just figured I'd show some of the work um, uh, in its undamaged form so you can see it. But you can see the work, it's very rich. The colors are very vibrant. These are, are you know, I'm trying to pat myself on the back here, but. You know, the beautiful photos in the sense that, like, if you went into a gallery in La Jolla or any tourist town, um, these are the type, types of uh, photographs that you would expect to see, right? They're not like the Stephen Shore, dull colors, photographs, uh, like the table of a diner. And you're like, why didn't you photograph that? You know, they're not flat landscapes taken in the middle of the day, uh, which is more kind of the, what you expect within sort of the language of contemporary art. You know, this is more the language of commercial art, right? And I did this intentionally because what I wanted viewers to do is look at these photographs and go, oh my God, this is really beautiful. 
I value this. You know, a lot of art, as, as we know, you know, for those of us who spend time around art, like, you know, it, it could be, uh, you know, it's abstract expression of work, it splatters of pain. People go, well, I could have done that. My kid could have done that. That's not really art. But what I wanted to do was create works that people go, I can't do that. Wow, that's really beautiful. That is art. And so when people say that is art, then they place a value on it, place a high dollar value on it. And so then the process of destruction becomes that much more difficult. So, you know, I specifically was using this language of commercial art in service of a larger concept that I was working with. And so when I talk about language, you know, there's different languages. Like I say, there's the language of contemporary art, which is often more, uh, you know, more subtle, more stupid, or maybe harder to uh, um, appreciate based purely on its, its visual aesthetics. Um, and then there's the art of commercial photography, which is very easy, you know, you get it. Nobody has to explain it to you. That uh, uh, this code school is uh, code school uh, hodads. These are called hodads, and um, you know, they're all they're all around right here. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, and uh, I'm open to questions, comments. If you're gonna throw something, give me one, and I will talk behind you. Uh, Just a reminder to repeat the questions for folks. Okay, we'll do. Yeah, in, in the back, and then I'll get to. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of that. I think we're going to give you a microphone. You know, sorry, if I do. You have an input. Does that change from? So usually, so the question was, uh, when I start a project, uh, if I have something in mind, does that change as I go through the project? I, I consider myself a conceptual artist. Not, you know, there's, there's my idea of a conceptual artist is that I have a very strong concept that, um, that, that guides the work. And so when I start a project, I usually know exactly what it's going to look like at the end. Um, I, you know, I like, I, I, I don't, a lot of photographers will just kind of they take photographs of where they see and then they put it together as an art show at the end of it. I don't do that. Like if I have a project, I know what I want and I, I go for it. And for example, uh, my one of my current projects is photographing areas that have been burned in the Florida fires, the wildfires uh, here in California on the West Coast. And so I know what I'm, I'm going at. I, I do not deviate from that at all. And, uh, you know, the, the exhibition here, I think I shot it in the space of five or six days, you know, uh, and I think most photographers take a lot longer, but because I know exactly what I want, I can just get at it, you know, not messing around. Uh, there was a question over here. So for the anchorage uh, for your live and sound or something, right? How long did it take you to put that show together? Uh, so the question was for the anchorage show, how long did it take me to put that together? So with uh, the Anchorage Museum commissioned me to uh, photograph people in the many communities within Anchorage and then put that together as a show. So the work there consists purely of people from the Anchorage uh, uh, area. And I believe I spent uh, about 10 days photographing. We were all over here, there, everywhere. Um, so I photographed there. Uh, in May, and then over the summer, worked uh, to produce the images, and then they printed the images in uh, Anchorage and did the show. And the show was out in September. So, which, you know, for a museum to work that quickly was, uh, you know, like this show, I shot it in 2019, and uh, I think had a commitment from the museum by, you know, the end of 2019. You know, so it took. What almost two years for the show to come alive, which is more difficult. Um, so for the Anchorage Museum to turn something around up here is pretty great. As the artists just want to get it out there. Was there a question here? Yeah. Um, I still know a lot about the photography. I don't know whether you know digital enhanced 
images or darker, but I'm just wondering how much manipulation of the images that you might do after you take them, or if you do any at all. Well, okay, so the question is how much manipulation do I do of uh, the images? Um, you know, it depends on the project. For example, my Bakken project, you know, I convert them to black and white, I do dodging and burning, that's it. It's a straight documentary project, and I really try to abide by the rules of the document, documentary genre. Now, with the art, anything goes, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, part of what I'm trying to do is make these juicy, beautiful images. So I use all the tools that a commercial landscape photographer would use. And yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, make them look really great. And so I, you know, I, I'm in Photoshop and Lightroom. Mean, everything's shot digitally with a moving format digital camera. So that the images themselves are very rich and can be a lot of uh, Yeah. There's a, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about uh, an artist transforming somebody else's work. What are your views about that? What I think is interesting about your work is that it's way it's other people transforming your work. Can you talk a little bit about your feeling about that? And uh, just a comment. Uh, so the question is how do I feel about other people transforming my work? And you know, it's really actually I I I love having my work on display and I, I and and seeing what people bring to the work. You know, the, the woman who uh, uh, she's the hostess here at Panama 66, right outside the, the gallery. She brought a completely different interpretation of the work than I had in mind, something I never would have thought. And um, and so, you know, seeing people, you know, damage the work, paint the work, do whatever it is they do. Sometimes like, that's not what I would do, but I stand back and say, okay, that's okay. This isn't what, I, what I'm expecting. But they're gonna bring something unique to the, um, to this. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little scary, but it's also deeply rewarding to see people in that. Because it, and it means they care, right? And, uh, you know, nothing is worse than having art that people just walk by and don't pay attention to. I'd rather be hated than not, than, than ignore it. Okay, we have a question in the back. We have a question on Zoom. Um, do you have any advice for other artists who are looking to make statements of their art? <laughs> do I have any advice for artists looking to make a statement with their work? Make a statement! <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to stand for something. Uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, I think it's really easy for us as artists, as individuals, we look at the success of others and then we look at what we're doing and say, wow, I'm not doing what they're doing. You know, what I'm doing isn't very valuable. But, you know, uh, I, I put my work on my fence and and I didn't put it in, in the gallery. And, and, you know, by doing what I do, which was unique, that opened up all kinds of doors. Um, so I think you, you, you know, you just really have to, you have to find your voice. You have to be true to what what you do, and um, and do that. And and the thing that you do is not, it's what, you know, it's better to be different than it is to be better. That's the number one advice I tell photographers and artists. Better to be different than it is to be better. Is my art better than somebody else's? We can have a discussion about that all day long, but we can tell whose work is different, right? And if when we're different, that's when we stand out. And so it's the challenge to be different too, because you know you see the work that's being done, and if you're different, you're like, well, I'm not. You know, who's going to care about my work? And that's tough as an artist because you know you're, you're trying to make work. And, you don't know if anybody's going to care, but you have to. You have to. You have to just keep going with that, and it's important to be different. And uh, and then, yeah, you want to say something with your art. And if you're saying the same thing as everybody else, you know, oh, okay, that's nice, but uh, it's only going to get you so far. I don't know if any of that helps, but that's kind of my philosophy. Yes. Okay. More. More from the internet. Oh. 
where that will go, what the process will be. You know, so, okay, one of the challenges as an artist is you have to make work, which is incredibly time consuming. Last, last winter, or last fall, I spent six weeks on the road, uh, you know, and then uh, making work for the show. And, 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 you know, so where does the work go? And then I have to, you know, I have to put on my little marketing hat and be a business person, try and get it to galleries and whatnot. So I don't really know where it's going to go. I'm making the work and, and uh, hopefully fame and fortune is just going to fall out of the sky. And, and I can, uh, you know, people are demanding that I, I put work in the gallery. But that's not how it works. You know, I, I, have, to, I have to go to work and, and uh, you know, find the opportunities for it. Um, but in the meantime, you know, uh, Right now is tough to photograph because the fires are still burning, but hopefully in the in a month or so when the fires will start to uh, get put out, I'll hit the road again and I'll make work, which is an artist that I love to do, right? Pull off from the other and making the work and, and you know, and it's a challenge because I'm going into areas that are oftentimes off limits. Um, I started motorcycling just so I would have a way to access these, these otherwise inaccessible areas, you know, drive way off the road and uh, something that's illegal, I get thrown in jail if I was there, so I can kind of figure out ways to get in there. And, and uh, so I'll just keep doing that, and then, uh, you know, get the opportunity to do it. Yes? Paula, are you seeing the Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think with, with this body of work, um, the, the destruction is already there. And again, I'm working with this idea of the, the language of commercial photography. So I'm taking these areas that are, so what I'm doing is I'm photographing the landscapes themselves. I'm not, I'm not working as a photojournalist, um, um, you know, documenting the lives of people or the people. You know, somebody else can do that, and, and, and that's an important role. But my role, I, the, the role I've taken, uh, I've given myself is to document the actual landscape. Kind of like, you know, all right, America, this is your new landscape. You, you bought it. Here's what you bought. You know, like, this is what Yosemite would look like. This is what the Sierras look like. This is, you know, this is what Big Sur looks like. This is what, you know, uh, John Cleen looks like. Here it is. We own it. And, and I'm making it look very pretty. It's a beautiful photograph. And again, the idea is to draw people in. Look at these photos, aren't they pretty? But they're grotesque. And this is this is what this is what we got. I don't know if I'm answering any question, but that's that's going along with this one. Uh, look, let's see. Uh, I, we'll start here and then we'll go back. Lots of questions. That's great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Just an observation based on that last really excellent comment or question. And that is, um, it would seem that, you know, the destruction with the fire, it's just now that it has been caused by corporate interests, let's say, uh, electric companies that haven't undergrounded and maintained their facilities. Um, at least that's my sense that a great many of those destructive fires have been caused that way. And it's just something you might look at. In terms of destruction, you know, pristine areas, and how much of it is natural, and how much of it is, is caused by lack of regulation or moving around. Well, so here's what I would say: is that the photographs tell us, and they tell a story of destruction, and then that hopefully motivates others to, um, you know, look at the cause and ask the questions. Right. Is that Implicit is that part of your, you know, your work on books and hunters? Did you have some kind of written text that explained about the lack of regulatory you know, taking away of federal status? I'm, I'm just asking that. Yeah, yeah, well, so uh, have some kind of explanation. Yeah, so uh, there's wall text that explains it. There's also a video uh, of me talking about it and talking about my process. Uh, and then they're, they're going to add to that video as well some of the uh, what's taking place in you know, the process of production here. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I try and it's tough because nobody wants, you know, people don't want to read 
So a lot of it is kind of, you know, uh, talking to people in the one Thank you. But was there a question in the back, and then we'll get to one in the front. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by your approach of actually getting outside of the galleries, outside of the museums, people. And I was wondering how did you evolve to that? How did you, you know, at what point did you decide? They have to reach more people in virtual Well, that's what my talk was about. <laughs> but, you know, so I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I don't have an MFA. I don't have a PFA. And typically, in order to be successful in the art world, you need an MFA. In fact, the, gallery, the, the artist showing the blue chip galleries in New York City, something like a ridiculously high percent, like 60 or 80 percent, went to three or four MFA programs. You know, so if you didn't go to Yale, if you didn't go to Cal Arts, uh, you didn't go to RISD, you know, your chance of being shown in a, a blue chip New York gallery is almost zero. So, you know, but I'm an artist, I want, I want my art to be seen. So I can either try and bang my head against a system that is going not going to let me in. Or I can just do my own thing. And that's what I did with the Neighbors Project, right? It's like, I'm just putting it on my fence. Now, it, it wasn't that, I wish I could say that was a master plan that I had. You know, it just sort of happened that way. But once I did that, then I began to realize like, hey, I can do the biggest show in New York City all on my own. Like more people saw my show than Gagosian, than, you know, all the big galleries in New York City combined. Right. And uh, so, you know, that, and, and then it was the New York Times. Um, so, you know, so kind of, you know, starting with that neighbor's project here in, New York, in San Diego, it kind of opened up the door and made me see that, wait a second, I can do my own thing and, uh, and, and, and fill my own career on my terms. And then, you know, if it leads to, uh, Galleries and whatnot, then uh, museums. Like here I am. You know, then then that's great. Uh, there was a question up front. Yep, yeah, right, right here. Hello. Can you regarding the youth program, you had a term commercial landscape photography. Could you please share or explain the differences? Commercial versus a MFA landscape photography. That, in terms of, could you explain the nuances that make it make those differences in terms of what you do to it or what we see in the museum? Sure. So the question is, what's the difference between, uh, you know, quote unquote commercial landscape photography and and MFA landscape photography, which isn't you know really a thing, and it's all shades of gray. So someone could come up here and just do everything I said and say it and be 100% right, right? Okay. Um, but uh, to generalize, um, we've all been, you know, who, who here has been to the, the photo galleries in La Jolla? You know, there's the Peter Lick Gallery, there's the National Geographic uh, photo galleries. You know, you go in there and you see these photographs, you know, they're glossy with beautiful, rich colors that don't even exist in nature, right? You know, these fantastic themes, sun setting, and, you know, the, the zebras or the natural arch, you know, with the sun coming in at just the right angle. And, you know, and it's just really pretty and beautiful and perfect, right? That's commercial landscape photography. And, and that's what most people consider to be art, right? They go in, they go into Peter Lick Gallery. He's got his gallery in Hawaii. And I think there's one in Hawaii. That, uh, you know, in, in Las Vegas, and you know, and, and people spend a lot of money to have to be considered art. And uh, and then you have art uh, within the, the sphere of contemporary art. Contemporary art being sort of the art that you see in in galleries, uh, such as in New York City or Los Angeles. We don't really have contemporary art galleries here in in, in, uh, in, in San Diego, and maybe the Tech Gallery. But 
these are our, our uh, galleries and works that challenge our notions of what we consider art to be, and that 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 try and push the uh, visual art in a new direction, right? Um, and and you know are investigating different ideas, and so you know they're, so they're not looking to be just purely visually appealing. There's there's quite a message, and so what happens then is there's a a, a a movement away from just from the purely visually appealing um, that has more meaning to it. Um, you know, the Becker's uh, uh, are of Germany, they had this whole series back uh, 15, 16, 17 of water towers, just black and white water towers, very boring. They put them together and assemble them. And that really helped shape a lot of contemporary photography where they took this very boring subject photograph it straight ahead, no odd angles, just as straight as you can, right? You know, Richard Avalon with his portrait, just straight ahead, right? White backdrop, no smile, no expression, just, you know, um, uh, I, I'm, I always forget, but uh, uh, very, very flat, right? And which is, a, it's a move, it's a, it's a step away from, um, you know, visually beautiful images looking out this is So that's kind of the, the difference there. I don't know if that really explains it. There is no one particular style, but you know, what I try to do is use this very sort of glossy, beautiful visual imagery and then take it over and use it to communicate a deeper concept. Because I know that I can get people with that. And then once I get it, I, I, I call it my Trojan horse. I, I use the beauty of the photograph to, to attract people. And then once they're in, the, you know, the, the Trojan horse is weak and you can deliver my message of environmental damage um, or you know, social justice or whatever. It's not really Sorry about questions, but my answer for a moment. Any other questions? Do we kill it? Oh, one in the back. What, what do you mean? Oh, what happens to the actual uh, uh, works once once we're done? Well, that's a good question. Still trying to work on that. If anybody has a gallery out there that would like to show this work, you know, uh, I mean, you know, that's the challenge. With, uh, that's the, the, the challenge that we face as artists and photographers. But, um, you know, we do show us, and at the end of it, we have a second part that we have to figure out what to do with. Uh, open the suggestion. Oh, one more question. Just a simple one. You already mentioned that you are using Smith and Richard Avedon and uh, Gary Gallet. Are you, uh, have you been informed by any other artists? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I was in New York City, uh, it was, all I did was go to galleries and museums. I mean, you know. Uh, Jackson Pollock, you know, when I look at the, the, what we're doing with the work, you know, abstract expressionism, uh, you know, very much, you know, that, that, that idea of just sort of being physical with the work. But, you know, I, there's just too many for me to list. And most of my influences these days come from outside of photography. Okay. Oh, we got, well, well. but wait, but wait, there's more. Um, so, will the photographs be rehung in Gallery 15 after they've been defaced? Yes. So, come on back. They'll be up till the end of January 2022. So, there's lots of opportunity to come out and see them, enjoy lunch, and have a, a cold beverage out at Town 66, and come in and, and uh, enjoy the work. Make it, make it an afternoon. So, absolutely. Did we do it? Did we get it? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Thank you very much. God, thank you so much for a really fascinating lecture and a great start to our season this year. Um, I want to thank everyone in the audience who's here. I want to thank everyone on Zoom for your patience through this, uh, the, the art of Zooming uh, and, and giving, delivering a lecture in person. Uh, I wanted to uh, also thank specifically two people, Mary Grillo. Um, who's handling Q&A, and Dean Barraza, our, our great chair of the Council this year. 
And one last thing is uh, my name is David Lamp. I'm the chair of the program. I'll introduce next time. We were a little less standard. Our next lecture is going to be uh, Dario Moreno, who will speak from the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, uh, focusing on issues of which topics around the use of both characters in community. It will be really fascinating. And finally, um, because we have Zoom then, and we have, you have a link to it, but this is for the folks online and, and even the folks that are here. Um, because this is, Zoom is set up, we're going to start it up again a little before 2 p.m. Pacific time. And you're welcome to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be out there for the destruction of John's spectacular works. So hopefully you'll join us again at 2 o'clock Pacific time this afternoon. Use that same link that you used to join this meeting, and we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you.